All right. Well, I am um, very excited to be here today to talk to all of you. My name is Marin Friesen. I'm an assistant professor in the departments of plant pathology and crop and soil science uh, here at WSU. And I'm going to talk to you today about nitrogen. Um, specifically, the nitrogen that we're all breathing in this room, since the air that surrounds us is 78% nitrogen. Um, however, this nitrogen is bound up as dinitrogen gas, which has this really strong triple bond. Um, and what this triple bond does is it makes this nitrogen gas inaccessible. Um, and so even though plants and animals are surrounded by nitrogen um, as gas, it's as inaccessible to them as uh, water would be to a sailor um, in the middle of the ocean, right? So we're um, drowning in nitrogen that we can't use. So there are three processes that can reduce this dinitrogen gas into forms that we can use. Uh, the first of these is lightning. Uh, the second is the Haber-Bosch process that produces industrial fertilizers. Uh, and then there's biological nitrogen fixation that my research program focuses on. Um, and so biological nitrogen fixation is really an incredible process that is able to break this really strong um, bond between nitrogen atoms at ambient temperatures and pressures. Uh, the Haber-Bosch process uses um, like 400 degrees and like many atmospheres and huge amounts of energy to conduct this reaction. Uh, so it's, it's really, really incredible that organisms can do this. So uh, biological nitrogen fixation contributes 195 megatons per year of nitrogen into the global nitrogen cycle. Um, and so here I've broken this down. Uh, so this is just to give you kind of a sense of scale. Uh, so this is nitrogen fixation in non-agricultural systems. Um, so the nitrogen fixation that we are getting um, globally put into terrestrial systems through the planting of legumes is um, about half the amount that would be um, going in uh, based you know, just on sort of naturally occurring legumes. Um, but what's really striking here to me is that the Haber-Bosch process, so industrial fertilizers, um, is contributing even more nitrogen um, than biological nitrogen fixation used to um, pre-industrial. So yeah, and then there's additional flows, um, transfer to the ocean, and then denitrification from both land um, and sea that uh, contributes to the total cycle. Okay, so here is a picture of this amazing enzyme that's able to conduct this reaction, uh, the nitrogenase enzyme. There's a conserved um, set of genes. Um, this is the, the conserved set, uh, and it's comprised of these, these very elaborate proteins um, that all work together. Um, and one important thing to note is um, these particular metal cofactor clusters uh, that are found at the active sites at this enzyme, um, and particularly this, um, this iron molybdenum metal cofactor is, is really critical for the actual uh, reduction reaction. And clicking. Okay, uh, so, so to summarize, here's a, a cartoon of that very complex uh, enzyme showing the different subunits um, and where all of the ATPs and the reducing power goes to. Uh, and so if we summarize all of this, we have nitrogen gas plus eight electrons um, and eight um, protons being converted with the assistance of 16 um, ATP molecules into two ammonia molecules and some hydrogen gas. Um, and so this is an extremely energy intensive process. Um, but ironically, the enzyme um, itself is poisoned by oxygen. Um, so, so both the dinitrogenase uh, reductase portion and the dinitrogenase um, subunit active sites um, both cease functioning if they're exposed to oxygen. So um, we can directly quantify these genes um, in 
any sample, um, including soils. Uh, so this, this NIF HTK, which encodes these different subunits, are um, highly conserved biomarkers of nitrogen fixation. Um, and a machine that um, I purchased uh, when I moved here to WSU called a smart chip uh, can do over 5,000 of these quantitative PCR reactions to measure um, how many copies of these genes are present in a sample. Um, and I'm working uh, with Tim Pollitz and a postdoctoral fellow funded by the USDA that's optimizing uh, multiple different gene-based biomarkers uh, for soil health, including nitrogen fixation. Um, and so I would love to, to talk to you guys if you have specific functions that you're interested in. Um, okay, so there are, uh, in addition to the molybdenum form of nitrogenase, some lineages of bacteria and archaea that have additional forms um, that lack molybdenum uh, but use iron and or vanadium. Uh, and the important thing is that these other lineages um, also have the molybdenum form. And in some cases, like the very famous uh, research nitrogen fixer, Azotobacter vinlandii, uh, they have all three forms. And so uh, Azotobacter vinlandii will, uh, when it has access to sufficient molybdenum, will produce the molybdenum-containing nitrogenase enzyme. And then once it uses up all of the mol molybdenum, then it will switch to the vanadium. If there's vanadium, it'll use up all the vanadium and then it'll switch to producing the iron only. Um, so they just want to fix as much nitrogen as they can. Um, okay, and so more uh, sort of deep evolutionary comparative work looking at how um, aerobic nitrogen fixation has evolved. Um, so here we have uh, lineages of bacteria that can grow um, under aerobic conditions. Uh, and down here are lineages, um, with the exception of this one little green one, uh, are lineages that fix nitrogen anaerobically, um, which is much easier in terms of the enzyme, but anaerobic metabolism doesn't produce as much energy, so they can't fix as much. Um, so yeah, so basically what you can see is uh, lots of shifts, uh, recruitment of a variety of different uh, nitrogenase genes into these operons, um, and a really clear shift, or relatively clear shift, um, in these, uh, these regulatory genes from the anaerobic uh, regulators of nitrogen fixation to regulators uh, you know, which respond to oxygen um, in the aerobic lineages. Um, and yeah, and so a lot of these, these aerobic nitrogen fixers will actually fix not under ambient um, concentrations of oxygen, but at these, these microaerobic concentrations of oxygen um, in places like rhizospheres and soil aggregates. Um, okay, so there are multiple mechanisms to protect nitrogenase from oxygen. Uh, so Zotobacter vinlandii, this very famous strain, is um, currently the only bacteria known to perform respiratory protection, um, where basically they have just really, really high levels of cellular respiration um, near their cell membrane, and this creates a low oxygen concentration within the cytoplasm, um, which sounds like it should be impossible, but people have built bio biophysical models of these cells, um, and it, it seems to work. Um, there's also soil aggregates, which we've heard about already today as being really important for lots of processes. Uh, they're also super important for nitrogen fixation because within the aggregates, there's limited oxygen diffusion. And so you can create these microaerobic and even anaerobic conditions um, within different parts of these aggregates. Um, a lot of nitrogen fixers, as well as other soil bacteria, will produce uh, extracellular polysaccharides. So this is a strain of rhizobia that my lab isolated, um, producing just heaps of EPS um, on plates. Uh, they'll also make um, azotobacter, for example, will, will produce alginate. Um, there's lots of different types of goo that soil bacteria are good at making. Um, and so these can also limit oxygen diffusion and uh, potentially assist in nitrogen fixation. And then um, one of the most cool examples that I'm aware of, um, of convergent evolution, you know, move over sharks and dolphins, um, is the inside of legume nodules. Um, so how many of you have, have actually cut open a legume nodule? 
lots of people. Yeah, so, so when you cut them open, if it's a, a healthy nodule, it'll be pink. And the reason that it's pink is the same reason that our blood is red when we bleed. And it's because of these hemoglobin molecules, which in legumes we call leg hemoglobin, um, that binds oxygen, just like the hemoglobin in our blood cells. Um, so I just find this absolutely amazing. Um, okay, so, so there's sort of these, uh, these two um, classes, roughly, of uh, nitrogen fixers. So symbiotic nitrogen fixers that fix in nodules. These are really highly specialized interactions. Um, the oxygen concentration is managed largely by the plant and the bacterial population just needs to respond. Um, so they you know, do this beautiful exchange of amino acids um, for carbon compounds. Everything's really tightly regulated um, versus these free living or associative nitrogen fixers where there's complex oxygen gradients um, in the rhizosphere or nearby soil aggregates. Um, these are typically really diverse systems, both in terms of the organisms involved, uh, as well as the uh, different types of carbon metabolism that are involved um, that I will say more about. Um, okay, so now I want to go through uh, four uh, sort of types of nitrogen fixing associations that uh, have relevance in cropping systems. Uh, so the first being my first and uh, truest love uh, in terms of nitrogen fixers, legumes and rhizobia. Uh, they're, they're not the original, but they may be perhaps the best. Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about Azola and cyanobacteria, then some really cool um, emerging work on grass diazotroph interactions, uh, and then finally some free-living nitrogen fixers that live in soil. So legumes and rhizobia. Uh, so as probably most of you know, um, and probably know uh, more about than I do, um, in terms of your own soils, rhizobia are bacteria, they live in the soil, and there's this complex signaling interaction that goes on with the plant, where plants will produce flavonoids and isoflavonoids, and the bacteria cells will sense these um, root exuded compounds and will produce nod factors, which are then perceived by the plant. And then the plant will initiate this beautiful developmental process where the bacteria will colonize through um, a, a root hair, an individual root hair, uh, and begin to develop a root nodule uh, on the, the various parts of the rooting system of a plant. And these rhizobia strains, um, almost all of them are actually incapable of fixing nitrogen without their plant host, um, which I still don't understand. It doesn't really make sense, um, but they've, they've lost one of the essential genes for nitrogen fixation that all free living nitrogen fixers have. Um, so they can only fix nitrogen with their host. Um, and despite you know the specialization and intimacy of this relationship, when legumes produce their seeds, um, those, these legume seeds don't contain rhizobia, um, unless we add them, which you know, a lot of legume seeds, when you buy them, will come with compatible rhizobia um, coated on them. So uh, a little bit of a broader uh, phylogenetic view. So, so legumes all are, fall within one family of plants, the Fabaceae, um, and all crop legumes fall within one subfamily of the Fabaceae. So, so it's very specialized evolutionarily. Um, there's one example in the Ulmaceae of a tree, a tropical tree. Um, tropical trees are always weird, uh, but they can also form nodules. Uh, and then there's also these related families uh, that I boxed in red that form actinorhizal associations with Frankia bacteria that are much um, less well studied, but so things like red alder, things like that. Um, rhizobia, on the other hand, are not a single cohesive evolutionary group. Um, they are interspersed with um, mammalian pathogens like brucella, uh, agrobacterium is nested within the clade of alpha proteobacteria. Um, and in uh, 2001, there was a really striking report of some uh, Burkholderia and Ralstonia strains in the beta proteobacteria. So these are, you know, 
very, very highly diverged bacterial lineages uh, that, were, that are nonetheless able to nodulate and form, um, yeah, form symbioses with uh, particular legumes. Um, and they've done so through the transfer of these nodulation genes from the alpha proteobacteria uh, into their genomes. Um, so there's, yeah, just really interesting things going on in terms of the, the evolutionary dynamics in these systems. Um, so two kind of types of legumes that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So grain legumes, um, peas, lentils, beans, um, garbanzo beans, and then forage legumes and cover crops. Um, yeah, forage legumes and cover crops, so like clovers and vetches, and uh, I think there's some lotus in here. Uh, and as was previously mentioned, not all rhizobia are created equal. Uh, so this is a collection of rhizobia strains from uh, some Californian clover that I have a project uh, looking at their patterns of variation. And so you can see, uh, so this is averaged across eight different clover species. There's um, huge amounts of variation in terms of how beneficial each strain is um, to its host. And um, yeah, not shown here is that when we pull out uh, individual host species, the, the rhizobia strains will sometimes have contrasting effects on different hosts. Um, so you can have one rhizobia strain that's really good on one host um, or a host cultivar that is not uh, a good performer on others. Um, and so I'm really interested in you know, the processes leading to these patterns of variation. Um, so we do know that the plants um, have a lot of control in the symbiosis. And so, for example, uh, in both soybean and metacago, um, these are some data showing that the plant will regulate the uh, number of rhizobia that it allows to proliferate within a nodule um, in response to how much nitrogen that nodule is fixing. Uh, so this is a, a really cool experiment um, where the researchers replaced nitrogen in the atmosphere around the root system um, with argon, so, so basically just preventing these rhizobia from fixing nitrogen. And they found a dramatic decrease in the number of rhizobia, um, both per nodule and per nodule biomass. Um, and then this is um, just a, some data uh, from my lab with a, a lab strain and a non-fixing mutant of that strain that can't produce a functional nitrogenase enzyme, uh, similarly showing a dramatic decrease in the number of rhizobia per nodule. Um, and another thing that uh, is really interesting and there's a lot of ongoing research on is the effect um, in terms of the host genotype uh, on its effect with rhizobia. Um, and so, so this is uh, some work from UC Davis where they took uh, different soybeans that were released in years ranging from 1937 up to 2001. Uh, they planted them out in experimental fields in California and either inoculated them with just a effective strain of rhizobia um, and found them to be you know, more or less comparable, except for this one um, cultivar, which didn't do so well. But when they uh, provided the plants with a mixture of um, effective and ineffective rhizobia, uh, the more recent cultivars were less able to discriminate between the effective and the ineffective strains, um, suggesting that some part of their either recognition or ability to regulate symbiosis has been, uh, has been lost uh, through domestication. Um, and so this is, is obviously of um, concern to um, people breeding legumes now. Okay, so uh, Zola and cyanobacteria are really cool. Uh, they're one of the few uh, plant mutualisms where the symbiont, which in this case is a cyanobacteria, um, actually disperses with the plant reproductive um, structures, which in the case of Azola, which is this cute little water fern, um, are spores. Uh, and together, they can rapidly grow in aquatic habitats. Um, so, yeah, so they are used widely uh, in rice paddies uh, in Southeast Asia and Hawaii, so um, probably less relevant for out here. Uh, there is one species uh, that occurs in Washington, Azola mexicana, uh, which looks like this. Um, and uh, 
yeah, this is all that I am going to say about Azola, um, other than I think they're really adorable plants. Um, okay, so grasses and diazotrophs. So, so this uh, is, yeah, a really interesting research area. Um, so it was contentious for a long time whether or not grasses could actually associate with and get nitrogen from diazotrophs. Um, and so back in the 50s and 60s, people noticed um, down in Brazil, where they grow a lot of sugarcane, um, you know, that they could grow uh, sugarcane year after year without adding any nitrogen um, and, you know, still got the same yields. Uh, and so people suspected that there were nitrogen fixers contributing to the system and isolated a lot of surface associated nitrogen fixers. Um, they couldn't demonstrate nitrogen transfer uh, from these surface associated fixers. Uh, then more recently, they've been able to identify and uh, people are working on characterizing these endophytic nitrogen fixers. Uh, so things like gluco, uh, glucon acetobacter, uh, herbosporellum, and some strains of Burkholderia. Uh, and this is a really uh, interesting experiment that um, again is done down in Brazil, but basically it's uh, doing these, these two fertilization gradients. So increasing nitrogen uh, from 0, 60 to 120 um, or increasing molybdenum. So that really critical metal cofactor. Uh, and so you can see when molybdenum is not added, there's um, a pretty strong response to nitrogen. Um, but when at the highest levels of molybdenum addition, um, and this is in grams per hectare, so right, so really micronutrient. Um, at the highest levels of molybdenum addition, uh, fertilizing with additional nitrogen doesn't increase growth. Um, and so what this suggests is that the nitrogen limitation um, that they're seeing, at least in this particular, uh, you know, where this experiment was done, um, that the nitrogen limitation is really a molybdenum limitation, and that you know that if there was a sufficient molybdenum, that uh, you know that these nitrogen fixers would be able to provide enough nitrogen for the plant. Um, and there's been uh, work in the last decade or so suggesting that many tropical soils. Uh, that people initially thought were nitrogen limited are in fact molybdenum limited. Um, and so, yeah, so this is just a really interesting case uh, thinking about, you know, what is really limiting production. Um, there's this um, incredible example that uh, was done um, largely by people at uh, University of Wisconsin, Jean-Michel uh, and I think some folks at Davis in collaboration with Mexican scientists. Uh, and so, so they were working um, with some uh, Mexican scientists looking at these land races of maize uh, that live sort of up in higher, uh, more like cloud forest type climates. Uh, and these are really unusual land races in that they produce these aerial roots um, that secrete high amounts of this mucilage uh, that will like drip off the roots um, onto the soil. And what they found, um, which, yeah, just totally blew my mind, is that there are nitrogen-fixing bacteria that colonize this mucilage and provide fixed nitrogen to the corn. Um, and so they had funding, uh, I believe mostly from Mars, uh, to build these enormous 15N2 gas chambers, and they grew these plants, full-size plants, in an enclosed chamber, um, inoculate, like spiked the atmosphere, with isotopically labeled nitrogen, and we're able to demonstrate that uh, the, this nitrogen fixing association through this root goo uh, was able to, to provide nitrogen to the plant. So yeah, so super amazing. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot more really cool research uh, coming out on this system. Okay, so I haven't worked in any of those systems. Um, I have, however, for the last few years been part of a project looking at switchgrass, uh, diazotroph interactions on marginal lands in Michigan. I was faculty at Michigan State before moving out here. And the motivation for this project was an observation that uh, during switchgrass establishment, um, so these are yield uh, responses to fertilization um, on a perennial stand of switchgrass um, in three subsequent years. Uh, and so in the first year, uh, there's you know, a pretty 
constant response to nitrogen fertilization. Um, but then in 2010, and even more strongly in 2011, you know, there's, there's, the response gets really flat, really fast. Um, and so we wondered whether or not they were uh, getting nitrogen from diazotrophs. Um, and so as part of this ongoing project, uh, we've been going out to these marginal land plots in Michigan. Um, this is just one year of data and sampled the switchgrass rhizosphere cores um, every two weeks. Um, so these cores are not just the tightly bound rhizosphere. Um, it's also root sort of associated uh, just to make the sampling feasible. Um, so we would take these, these little cores and then do lab incubations um, to get nitrogen fixing potentials. Um, and yeah, and so here's the data uh, in terms of micrograms of nitrogen fixed per gram of soil per day um, throughout one switchgrass growing season. And so we have uh, fertilized um, subplots and unfertilized subplots. So this was a split plot design, like, like the design that Lynn showed you, where half was fertilized um, just once at the very beginning of the growing season uh, with super U, a urea, with some additives, uh, and then the unfertilized and the light green. And so, you know, so we got our first uh, time point of data back from this year, and we were like, oh, cool, there's higher fixation in the unfertilized plots. Uh, and then we got the second time point back, and we we're like, oh, they're the same. Um, and yeah, and so, you know, there's, there's some time points where they're different, there's some where there's the same, um, there's a lot of variation, there's um, this massive spike uh, towards the end of the growing season, um, which we initially thought um, had to do with senescence, but uh, the data from uh, our most recent year uh, shows a spike in the middle of the summer. Um, so yeah, so we're still trying to figure out you know, what is actually driving these patterns, um, but suffice it to say, there's a lot of variation uh, in terms of these rates. Um, and yeah, and I'm involved in ongoing work to try to characterize the microbes that are involved. Um, okay, so uh, obviously there's a lot of interest in potentially having nitrogen fixing grasses, um, such as wheat and corn, uh, and so there's been a lot of work uh, in the past, um, you know, probably 10-ish years, five to 10 years, uh, international projects to try to engineer nitrogen fixation into cereal crops. Um, and yeah, by going to conferences and workshops, uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to interact with some of these people and talk about these ideas. And I mean, it's just an, an incredible, like conceptually advance uh, in terms of you know how we think about plants and their abilities. Uh, so yeah, so these are just just um, four projects. So uh, so the first is uh, Louis Rubio, uh, based in Spain, has been funded by the Gates Foundation to try to engineer nitrogen fixation into a plant mitochondrial cell. Um, and is making uh, good progress there, getting gene expression, all these things. Um, Devaki Bhattacharya and her team um, at the Carnegie are working on engineering uh, cyanobacteria into a nitrogen fixing organelle. So basically taking a nitrogen fixing um, cell and you know, turning it into an organelle. So basically asking the question, you know, what if, what if the chloroplast in plant um, had retained its ability to fix nitrogen? Um, yeah, I'm trying to make that happen through engineering. Um, Giles Oldroyd uh, is funded by the Gates as well as National Science Foundation to engineer uh, the signaling from the legume rhizobia interaction uh, into, uh, he's currently working in barley, but, and also maize, uh, to try to get these grasses to associate with uh, designer nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, and then this, this really cool project that Jean-Michel Henné at Wisconsin is doing is uh, engineering candidate nodulation genes uh, identified by comparative genomics um, into plants. And so they're focusing on poplar right now. And so they're basically trying to get the nodulation structure um, and kind of taking the approach, you know, if we build it, they will come. Um, so yeah, so I mean, so this, this field is sort of ripe for, for these kinds of, of breakthroughs and, you know, when it will actually translate into your guys' fields, I have no, like, no way of predicting that. Um, yeah, but it's just really fascinating. 
Okay, so then free living nitrogen fixers. Uh, so there's basically nitrogen fixers everywhere. Um, they're incredibly numerous and very diverse. Um, you can literally isolate them from just about anywhere. Um, this is a picture of Azotobacter vinlandii. It's really widespread in soils and highly aerobic. Um, here's uh, Klebsiella oxytosa, which is an anaerobe found in soil. There's methanogenic um, Urea archaeota, which are anaerobic archaea that are uh, yeah, believed to be common in anoxic soils. Um, and then here's some cyanobacteria uh, that differentiate these, these heterocysts where nitrogen fixation occurs. Okay, and then, you know, when you're a free-living nitrogen fixer, you don't have a plant to rely on. Um, so, so unlike uh, the symbiotic nitrogen fixers, where the plant does a lot of the work, you know, in terms of carbon availability and dealing with oxygen, um, other nutrients needed, you know, free-living nitrogen fixers sort of have to, have to deal with variation in all of these things. Um, yeah, including uh, diversity of carbon sources and compounds. Um, and so some of the work uh, within the switchgrass project that I've been involved in has uh, been looking at the role of, of carbon source on these rates that we've measured. And you know, this was really an urgent methodological question for us because we needed to know, you know how to measure these nitrogen fixing potentials um, in our samples. Uh, and so this is Darian Smarsina's work, a, a grad student who's about to finish at uh, Michigan State. And so what she found, so this is um, samples from two different sites, uh, Lake City and Lux Arbor, um, both in Michigan. And so she uh, subsampled and measured nitrogen fixation through uh, 15N incorporation, uh, feed, basically feeding these little cores um, either a cocktail of carbon um, or less diverse, um, these are both less diverse, carbon mixes um, or controls just had water. Um, and so she found, uh, so consistently at the two sites, the highest levels, um, potential levels with the carbon cocktail, um, which had uh, glucose, sucrose, and malate. Um, yeah, definitely better in both cases than just the sucrose and malate alone. Um, we're not really sure why at Lake City um, the sucrose alone did better than sucrose and malate, uh, some kind of inhibition, but we know that the microbial communities are, are really different at these sites. Um, and the, the scale is cut off here, um, but the, the total rates at Lux Arbor are um, an order of magnitude higher um, than Lake City, uh, which we think has something to do with the differences in soil types between those two sites. Um, and so the, the other thing that free-living nitrogen fixers encounter is that um, they, you know, they typically are able to fix nitrogen um, from the atmosphere, but you know, they also have these other nitrogen pools that they can access. Um, and so there's, there's low molecular weight nitrogen, so ammonia and nitrate present in soils. Um, also high molecular weight nitrogen. So Kate Reardon, who couldn't be here today, talked about some of the exoenzymes that bacteria produce to liberate nitrogen from these complex molecules in the soil, um, things like chitin, um, other products of decomposition. Um, and so a former postdoc that worked with me um, and I came up with this model where if you are a, uh, a bacteria that has some um, you know, cellular nitrogen pool and you're living in the soil and you have access to these three pools, uh, just thinking about, you know, what order should you eat this nitrogen in? Um, and then what would the implications of that be? And so, you know, so pretty obviously, you know, you want to eat the most delicious, um, easiest to access nitrogen first. Uh, so basically, you know, you eat dessert first. Um, so, so you chow down on the ammonia nitrate that's available. Um, and so we know, you know, there's lots of data uh, showing that when these low molecular weight nitrogen um, forms are available, that represses nitrogen fixation and exoenzyme production, because these are both really costly mechanisms. Um, and then, you know, as uh, you know, you're finishing your dessert, um, you, uh, we, or we predict rather that these, um, these bacteria would transition from just eating low molecular weight nitrogen and they would invest some of that nitrogen that they've consumed into nitrogenase. 
um, and then transition to fixing atmospheric nitrogen. Um, and then once they've accumulated um, additional nitrogen within their cell, um, then we predict that they would start investing some of that nitrogen um, you know, because it, it requires this continuous input of ATP um, and protons, uh, that they would invest some of that into exoenzymes that they would then secrete out into the soil. And these exoenzymes would then liberate low molecular weight nitrogen from the high molecular weight sources, uh, which would then downregulate the, the atmospheric nitrogen fixation. So do you guys follow all that? No, yes. Sort of, maybe. Um, okay, so the so the take home from this, and I'd be happy to talk more about this if you guys are like actually interested. Um, <laughs> so the so the takeaway is that you know given that there's not just one form of nitrogen in the world, um, that we predict that these free living nitrogen fixers in these these variable environments um, they shouldn't fix nitrogen all the time. Um, because it's too expensive to fix nitrogen all the time. But instead, we predict that they should fix nitrogen in pulses. So kind of like what we saw um, with our switchgrass samples, which we don't, we don't know. We have um, some exoenzyme data um, and soil pools. And yeah, and so we're trying to, to integrate all of our data types to see if this is actually happening um, in our samples out there. Um, yeah, so. So there's, so there's, anyway, so there's a lot of challenges uh, in terms of, of studying free living and associative nitrogen fixing. Um, so probably the biggest challenge is that, you know, there's no in situ way um, today of measuring nitrogen fixation. Um, so we can't, you know, we can't go out to a field um, and have a probe that tells us, you know, how much nitrogen is being fixed um, by a plant in the field. Um, we have to take a sample. We have to do stable isotope incorporation. Um, yeah, so it's, that's like, I think probably the biggest limitation um, in the field right now. Um, there's also, you know, really high diversity uh, genetically and metabolically of these organisms um, that just makes things complicated uh, in terms of taking measurements and, you know, thinking about what's happening. Um, and then, you know, it's challenging to estimate these rates overall uh, since they depend on the measurement conditions, um, right? So I showed you just like a tiny bit of data. Uh, you know, looking at how our rate estimates depend critically on which carbon we're putting on our um, soil samples. Um, yeah, we did similar optimization with the amount of oxygen in the vials where we're actually uh, performing these incubations. Um, also things like temperature, um, soil type, other, other factors. Okay, so to, so to summarize uh, kind of, you know, where the field is at in terms of understanding. Um, so nodules, we have a pretty good handle on them. They're rhizobia and they're frankia. Uh, they have high amounts of energy provided by the plant. The plant also provides oxygen production, very cushy. Um, you know, we understand a lot about how the nitrogen is transferred. Um, rates are pretty high. Um, really variable, but, you know, but overall pretty high. So 50 to almost 500 uh, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Associative nitrogen fixation, fixation uh, they're, you know, they're still associating with the plants. Um, so we know, you know, a fair amount about them. Uh, there's, you know, probably some kind of intermediate level in terms of energy being provided by the plant, uh, the plant, you know, we know that the rhizosphere does have reduced uh, uh, oxygen concentrations, um, you know, because the, the plants are respiring. Um, so they're, they're breathing in uh, oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. Um, there's, you know, evidence, good evidence of uh, 15N transfer between the bacteria and the plant. Uh, the rates are uh, typically somewhat lower than, than with nodules, so two to 170 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Um, and then there's kind of the wild west of free living nitrogen fixers. Uh, there's, yeah, these heterotrophs, Zotobacter and Klebsiella. Um, there's also uh, free living autotrophs that can fix their own carbon and nitrogen, um, because who needs a plant when you can just do it all yourself? 
Um, so yeah, so they you know, typically um, have access to even lower amounts of energy. They have to deal with oxygen on their own. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, we just understand a lot less about the biology, um, but evidence uh, to date suggests that the total contributions of these associations are, um, are significantly lower. So one to 80 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year for these autotroph um, autotrophic free livers and only one to 10 for these heterotrophic free livers. Um, but yeah, but so this is, you know, sort of wild strains that are out there. Um, and, you know, any day there could be, there could be breakthroughs in terms of engineering these. Um, okay, so Hang and Carol um, told me not to just talk about ecology um, and evolution, but to make sure that I talked a little bit about practices um, that I think um, should or might promote nitrogen fixation, uh, and so and so these are these are not like grounded in um, on farm research, but I would love to test some of these ideas if any of you are interested. Um, so yeah, so number one, uh, make sure soils have sufficient nitrogenase cofactors. Number two, reduce mineral nitrogen inputs, plant legumes, which it sounds like everyone's already doing, and maintain soil aggregates. And so I'll just go through each of these um, in the last few minutes that I have. So in terms of nitrogenase cofactors, so molybdenum uh, is the most widely used cofactor. It's, um, it's actually really hard to measure in soil. Um, we, yeah, we, uh, we're trying to find a lab to, to measure molybdenum levels um, for my switchgrass project, and we weren't, you know, we were able to find a lab that would give us a number, but they told us to not necessarily believe the number, um, so we're not really sure what to do with that data. So we've been thinking about, you know, just setting up some fertilization trials, just add molybdenum and see if you get more nitrogen um, being fixed. Um, yeah, I also learned um, while I was preparing this talk that acidic soils, um, so we all know that acidic soils have higher availability of some metals like aluminum, um, they actually have lower availability of molybdenum because of some chemical thing. Um, so, so that could be a, a problem around here. Um, I don't know how much of a problem it is, and I don't know if anyone does know, but if you do, I would love to talk to you. Um, okay, so then uh, in terms of reducing or perhaps optimizing would be, would be a, better, a better phrasing. Uh, mineral nitrogen inputs. Um, so we know that ammonia and nitrate inhibit nitrogen fixation directly uh, for free livers. Uh, we also know that legumes are particularly sensitive to nitrate, uh, more so than ammonia, and they'll reduce nodulation in response to nitrate, um, but often not ammonia. Um, just because of the, the signaling that they use. Um, also, in terms of slightly longer time scales, we would expect that nitrogen fixers would be less competitive in soils when there's mineral nitrogen added, um, uh, but that, you know, based on this sort of order of uh, eating nitrogen model, uh, that nitrogen fixers should be either as competitive or perhaps more competitive when complex nitrogen, um, high molecular weight nitrogen is added. So through things like manures or residues or things like that. Um, okay, so legumes, obviously there's lots of legumes. Um, there's cool uh, intercropping work being done uh, that hopefully Isaac will tell us about uh, with legumes, uh, legumes and canola. Okay, and then maintaining soil aggregates. So these soil aggregates provide these low oxygen um, grading into fully anaerobic habitats for free living nitrogen fixers. Um, and many nitrogen fixers, you know, will build these aggregates around themselves um, by secreting polysaccharides and other compounds. So uh, in summary, uh, nitrogen fixation um, by bacteria and archaea, this is of soil with his nitrogenase hammer in one hand and his ATP lightning bolt in the other, um, breaking apart the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. Um, I actually can't believe that someone drew this. This is like totally brilliant. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a really important part of the global nitrogen cycle. Um, you know, it's done by this one enzyme. Um, and there's uh, really diverse nitrogen fixing bacteria in archaea. They can be anaerobic and, aero and aerobic. They all have nitrogenase requiring molybdenum. Um, there's legumes, azola, and grasses all have really well studied nitrogen fixing partners. 
Uh, and there's also huge diversity, uh, very understudied, I think, of free living nitrogen fixers in soil um, that fix nitrogen sometimes, but probably not all the time. Thank you.